The practice of underpainting is almost as large an area of study as oil painting itself. The purpose of an underpainting is to establish the composition, an overall light dark pattern, while initiating the development of volumes and substance to the forms. An underpainting allows you to envision the totality of the pictorial ideal. In addition to correcting drawing errors, the underpainting's primary purpose is to fix that all-important notan, which is a Japanese term for light-dark harmony. Generally speaking, there are three types of underpainting. There is the fully worked up monochromatic grisaille, such as this example by the French classicist Ingres. This is the academic approach, where little is left to chance. However, the classical grisaille of mixed white and black paint possesses an Achilles heel. As the white paint ages, it becomes more translucent and the black paint in the gray mix will dominate. Hence, the overall picture will darken significantly, especially if there were significant corrections and overpainting of the grease eye. If a basic oil turpentine medium is employed, this darkening is all but guaranteed. The solution is to use a thixotropic resin-based medium such as Venice turpentine, which suspends the pigment and nullifies the oil's darkening. The Renaissance approach often employed the Verdacchio, which is a green-hued underpainting. Michelangelo's unfinished entombment exhibits his painting process from beginning to finish. The Christ figure is a wholly resolved Verdacchio underpainting. In this workshop, we will be using an optical grisaille utilizing the gray streaked yellow ochre and prematura upon which translucent forms of raw umber are developed, followed by a transparent black to deepen our darkest values. Raw umber is a warm hue. Black is cooler. Achieving a mother-of-pearl translucency in oil requires a practice of alternating layers of warm and cool hues. The optical grisaille resolves many of the problems of the gray mixes of the classical grisaille. The imprimatura holds the light middle tones. The raw umber and black produces the darker values and concludes with a select impasto of white lead paint, or underpainting white, that supports the highest values of the overpainting as the oil paint grows more translucent over time. The final appearance of an optical grisaille is a painting that exhibits a higher key of color than what can be achieved by an academic grisaille or even direct prima. The key for achieving a translucent grisaille is the fixotropic medium of stand oil, Venice turpentine, and Damar varnish. That's the medium that we'll be using. Unless your ambition is to produce technically accurate 17th and 18th century paintings, then we need to exceed that we do not have access to the same materials that Rubens and others enjoyed. And even if we had access to the historical pigments and binders, there is the dubitable question of what exactly did Rubens use. At best, we can only speculate as there were no records or recipes left for posterity. I doubt that Rubens used raw umber for the initial sketched and blocked in layers of his underpainting. In the 1600s, Dutch painters were entranced by the wondrous and wickedly beautiful pigment asphaltum. 
Asphaltum is a bituminous pigment that surrenders a wondrous golden brown hue when dilute and a burning blackness when painted full strength. It is a weak tinting pigment that when reduced with a little white produces a lovely pearly gray. But asphaltum has a flagitious side. When ground into oil, it never quite solidifies. It becomes a gloopy slough that runs helter-skelter on the palette and runs down the canvas like a freshly liberated, freedom-crazed convict. Asphaltum needs to be melted into a hot oil resin turpentine mix to gain a workable paint. Even then, asphaltum tends to slump and creep. Artists such as Rubens, Van Dyke, and Beaujolais tempered asphaltum's difficulties by using it only as a glaze tempered by an overpowering varnish carrier. Rubens' exquisite handling of asphaltum and the medium used to tame it remains one of art history's great mysteries. Raw umber is a much easier pigment to work with and is a reasonable substitute for asphaltum. And this is the paint I will use for initial blocking in and development of forms. To begin our underpainting, I'm going to be using raw umber. And my medium is four parts turp to one part of the base. And I dilute my raw umber quite, quite a lot. It's going to be put on in like a transparent wash. And it's always a good idea to just first test it out. And that looks a bit too heavy. I want, I want to get to about that value right there. So just go add more medium. Okay, just give them a little, a little tester there. Okay. Okay, and that's about where I wanted to get there. I'm just gonna sort of rub that out with my finger here. For my initial blocking in of the underpainting, I'm gonna be using a large number 24 round brush. The worst thing we can do is of course is hold your ferrule up here and, and go into then all these niggling little details as if it were a coloring book. No, 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 no. Instead, I'm going to load up my brush with diluted raw umber. going to let my eyes fall into a deep squint. Okay. And I'm going to block in the major darks. This is both the head and the background. Okay. It's almost kind of like a, a cross hatching thing here. Okay, and this all falls into dark here. And it's good practice. Hold your brush further back of the ferrule. Okay, that will help you avoid getting overly tight. Okay, it's go so far and then I go back. You can, you can see this process in unfinished old master's works. Okay, you can see Rubens brought this down into this collar here. And the main thing is, as you, as we're blocking in here, is don't starve your paint. You need to mix up more, then by all means do so. So 
also a good chance to rehearse drawing with the brush. We don't want an even background, okay, because that will create quite a boring surface. Okay, we want to break up the light, so when it comes through, okay, we get a shimmering effect. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna bring this right up into the edge of the face here. I don't know exactly what Rubens may have done here. That's quite thin. Don't stop at this line. We call this a figure ground relationship. The ground, of course, is the background. The figure is the head proper. And we just bring it all the way down here. L nice loosey goosey. Not out of control, of course. Never want to paint out of control. At least not in this mode. But nor do we want to go tight. So indicating some of the rhythms of the hair. See how I'm back stroking into here? Okay, this, this gives us extra mileage when it comes to, you know, building up the forms later of the hair. Okay, that falls in the shadow, so does this. All working from, from the deep squint. Okay, if you make a mistake, it's no big deal. Okay, you can always take a cloth Okay, and wipe it out. Also, don't go back into it with a dry brush, because that's what happens. Okay, so I'm just going to go back into that for a second here. Now let's get into this dark forms the head here and see I'm, I'm just like scrumpling it in as it were So we'll get these larger shapes in quite simply here. Sort of take them all in one fell swoop. Okay, this is just a rehearsal as it were. Okay, and if you overshoot it, it's no big deal. I just use a finger just to Okay, and just, I'm just going to cross-hatch this in. Now, you got to work fairly fast because this sinks in pretty, pretty quickly, so. And then, if I need to, need to fix it, I'm going to take a, just a clean, dry brush. And if you want to smooth it out a bit, Okay, it's it's fairly easy, but but you want to get this before it sinks in. So if you have workmen showing up, then send them off to lunch. Okay, you don't want to be interrupted because it has to be done 
in one shot. With this shadow up in the eye, let's just take it quite broadly. Put it into a canthus there. Okay, let's go shoot it. That'll take care of it quite quickly. Soften that a bit with, again, a clean and dry round brush. Lovely shadow in here. A little dark up in here. Okay, back to my little clean brush. Don't overdo this though, because it will, um, it's only useful in small proportions as it were. Okay, don't, don't rely on that. And to get the face to turn, just going to lock, knock in a little bit of dark staring. You know, the old masters also would rub it with their, with their fingers. Titian especially, okay, he, in fact, he often sometimes boasted that he, he painted more with his fingers than he did with the brush. And of course, Rubens was a great admirer of Titian. And I think it's quite reasonable to think that he, he too rubbed in a fair amount, perhaps in the beginning, although later it was just straight paint application. Now I'm just going to go to a smaller brush. I'm just going to grab a, um, a number six filbert. Okay, he's a little bit of medium. And what I have constantly is a rag that I constantly use for wiping and adjusting the mediums on my brush so that we don't get any drippage, as it were. And then, just like we would use a needed eraser, I'm just going to finesse some of this stuff. Again, we don't want to be too tight on it, because this is quite general. And of course the rule is we always, always work general to specific. Okay, so I just want to sort of start indicating some of these plastic forms. It also helps as a rehearsal, as it were, for when we come to the later stages of the painting. You know, many painters, and especially the old masters, would rely on rehearsals. Okay, the, the British painter, for example, Francis Bacon, would often rehearse some of his brush strokes for his paintings on a bathroom mirror. Because he always wanted it to look absolutely effortless, as if he just approached it and knocked it in, but that oftentimes was rehearsed. And I figure painters of that level have to rehearse. It's probably something we too want to consider. Yeah, I think I'm just going to leave that there. Just going to go for a larger brush here, it's again, just with, with medium.
And frankly, at this point, okay, I, I need to sort of catch myself for a second here. I'm feeling I'm getting a little bit too finicky here. So I'm now just going to go back into the hair. I just want to clean, clean up, or not so much, but reiterate the light forms here. Not too much, just, just a little bit here. Okay, let's go come in pretty darkly here. And what I'm doing here is this is definitely a rehearsal for these wonderfully juicy brush strokes in there. I mean, I know Rubens did not do this, but it would profit us, I think, to do it too. To do, um, take a little rehearsal here. And this is as far as we want to go for this initial blocking in stage. And then we're going to go back in with our raw umber and start getting a little bit more specific and building out these forms. Now, for a beginner, I would suggest letting this dry. It'll be much easier to work on. More experienced painters, let it set for an hour or so. It dries very quickly, and then we can go in and, uh, and build, it up, build it up. So once again, I'm going back in with my large round brush. This is the number 24. You know, these Kevin Mongoose brushes that I like so much. Let's just do a little, let's just do a little tester here. Okay, that looks pretty good. You always want to do a tester in an area that's not going to cause you grief if it's not so good. So again, holding my brush back towards the end of the handle. Let's sketch it up. This is not arc. Remember, as in the drawing, in the cartoon, Rubens always employed these architectonic lines. Careful observation, okay? Again, this is not a coloring book. Go outside the lines. There's no reason to throw yourself in a river. A la Monet. I always usually like to start at the top of the head. Huh, how did I miss this? There's a little knot back up in here. You're allowed to use your fingers. Okay, again, a rag here always comes in quite useful. Back stroking okay, into this hair. So I found that a little bit too dark. So I got a little dry brush here. There's no medium. It's just, it's just dry. Okay. So it works as like a little knead eraser. Again, I have a handy 
handy rag. I always have a hooked here. It's, it's my, my little security blanket, as it were. Okay, it's dipping on medium there. Okay. It's constantly wiping on that rag down there. It's fortunately it's out of view here, but. I think it's more important to see the surface of the panel than whatever shenanigans I'm up to off camera. Okay, it's just and curving brush strokes. I want to get as much mileage as possible here. Gonna knock that down in tone a bit. Cause this is there's a lot of bristle brush work in there. And if you ever should find yourself running out of paint, never, never starve the paint. I have no idea what that shape is, but it's there nonetheless. Mm, that that would be pop out later. So let's just when in doubt go flat. Yeah, it's a little, little bit of this. A muscle there that's that's coming out a bit but again we want to keep that flat right now okay because we don't want that to pop out don't want to lose it but I don't want it to pop just into a little my dry brush here okay so again with a dry brush and this is sans any medium I'm just gonna soften up this edge here this is a that's a form edge. And form edges, as we know, take a soft edge. Okay. Whoops. Okay. No need. No need to go into cardiac arrest. Just, just wipe the brush down. Then we'll manipulate that shape into my into my other round. Well, it turns quite sharply. It's still primarily form shadow here, so this is like with a needed eraser here. Get into that little area here. This is probably where we I need a need a smaller brush, but. Try to discipline yourself not to go too small. Okay, here, this is a filbert. Now, Rubens didn't use filberts. They hadn't been invented yet. They used, um, well, mostly just rounds. And they made their own brushes. They just didn't have to, just didn't go online and, and order up a whole bunch more. All right. It's not going to be a, that kind of sinks in pretty fast sometimes. So let's go to our tissue brush here. I'm just going to rub that in. Okay, like I said, this is why we have fingers. Okay, again. We'll keep to as a larger brush as large a brush as I can get away with. Okay, I'll we'll wipe it on the rag there. I see I just sort of took that one fell swoop and a little touch there.
little touch to my rake hanging there. Okay, and try to train yourself always to hold your brush back here. I mean, sure, there's going to be times when we got to get in here, especially when we want to get those, um, those pupils. Okay, and if it's going to be uncomfortable at first, but like anything, if, if, you, if you missed a shot, give it the finger. It's just like, just like driving these days. Okay, and that's a little too much. So I'll give that the give that the give that the finger. That's not very nice. Don't think you want to put that in. <laughs> I think I'm just gonna to touch that out a bit. Now on close examination of Rubens, there are places where you can see he did do some rubbing in. Not as much as Titian, of course, but it's there. How can I rationalize that statement? It's, it's pretty hard. That's, well, it's pretty hard because it's more something that you smell. It's kind of like deer hunters who, who smell deer in the woods. Okay, just like that. The whole form and cast shadows and all in, in, in one stroke there. That filter, no, this philtrum is a bit of a devil. Okay, a nice little, a lovely little indication there of the node as it sinks in there. It's, now I didn't rub it. All I did is I just touched it. Okay? Just a playful little touch. Same as down with this the other node here. Now let's get this into this the upper lip. You know, not you know, the mouth is hard enough, but boy, trying to replicate what Rubens has done here, and he's just nailed his puppy. With one fell swoop, again, I'm just sorry, just going to touch that again. You know, and, and to try to redo that mouth, I don't know if Rubens could do it again. I mean, don't forget, we are doing a copy of the finest painter in Western of the Baroque. And this is his finest work. I mean, he never matched this. Maybe his wife, that's in the National Gallery. Well, I mean, she's not hanging out there, of course, but that lovely painting, you know, with the hat, the National Gallery in London. That comes close to this, but this is still, you know, it don't get any better than this. Okay, now that shape got a little bit wonky, and this is, you know, painting vague shapes. That keeps me up at night. And this area here, with just a few brilliant strokes, you know, Rubens has nailed down that an anatomical structure. And I'll tell you, he knew his anatomy. Now we'll go in with this uh, dry brush here. Okay, again, in case I didn't mention it, it's a, it's a number 22 round. Of course, every, every brand of brush has a slightly different measuring system. Here's American measuring, Imperial, British, Russian. All right. So don't get too hung up on that. Well, it's pretty vague in here, so 
we want to keep the vagueness here, but we don't want to... Okay, no, the light's not that strong on it either. Okay, so what we're doing with this underpainting then, it's these a mathematical or you know, philosopher's term, is we're taking an asymptotic approach. So as, as, as we keep going into the painting, ah, okay, now when this happens, the only thing you can really do is get the rag, wipe it out, okay, and give it another go, okay, otherwise it will just drive you nuts. Okay, I'm going to let that set for a minute or two. So I don't want to re repeat what happened here. Now, now what Rubes has done is he's taken his brush strokes this way, and this is, he's thinking of the composition, or, or more specifically, the rhythms here. He wants the eye coming in this way, and on close examination, you can see these. So these striated brush marks here. Okay. So I'm just going to go again with my dry brush. I just want to fix into the neck here. Just want it to set, but I don't want it to dry. Soften this edge a bit. It's sort of happening again here, but I'm not going to worry about it. Okay, we'll take care of that later. See how I'm dragging this into the hair also. Okay? It's this figure ground relationship. Let's just fix that drawing here a bit here. Okay. That's such a hard edge there. I'm just going to soften that up a bit here. No, quite interesting. An interesting aspect here is we have this horizontal line that he's drawn in here. It's just curious. It, it it does in a very subtle way sort of break the eye from just shooting up, you know, all these rhythms of the face, and and, and this seems to serve as a break. Of course, this is just. Speculation here, but we don't know. Because the only witness to this painting was Clara, and unfortunately she, she passed away a few years after this painting.
let's get this color in here Somewhat more of a an arc in there and it's, it's, it's in these informal drawing paintings that we can actually learn so much of the working process you know because a lot of this stuff is is left unbuilt up He's gone up in this, this upward diagonal direction here with his brush strokes. Again, I think, you know, his, his finely attuned sense of composition, you know, dictates that. You know, everything counts. Everything counts. And just double check that drawing part there and Paint sets up so fast, <clears throat> you can't take even think of taking a break. Okay, just gonna control the amount of medium on there right now. It's just a little bit drawing. Here's my finger, pull that down a bit. A bit. It's a lot easier to switch fingers than it is brushes. Okay, and at this point, I think our best, well, I was just going to say we should walk away, but <laughs> easier said than done. Just going to strengthen up back in here, because, you know, as, as we get further and further progressed, of course, then we we have to balance everything else. So this has to be a little bit darker. Okay. And you can sort of reshape your rounds as you brush and twirl them. They'll, that will help keep the point. Because with, this, with these soft hairs, they have a wonderful feel, but they also have a tendency to quickly splay. Let's pop it out a bit, okay. And going over this almost dry paint, 
It, prov it gives me a nice drag on the brush and this really helps. To get, you know, these, the drawing done here. Okay, a lot of, a lot of this painting is just pure drawing with the brush. And ideally, we want to take care of as many problems ahead of time as we can. Because we're going to have enough challenges coming up where we don't want to have to be, you know, fixing huge drawing problems. There will always be drawing problems that need to be taken care of, but we do want to minimize those. Okay, I'm starting to get a little too fussy here. But I just can't stop myself. So there into the hair. See this the paint here is, is, is fairly tacky on my brush. Oh, I wish I didn't do that. I really wish I didn't do that. But, oh well, it's, it's part of the process. So second for him is for an unfortunate moment and an eternity to get back out. So the painter's mouse trap, as it were. And the best advice I can give anyone at this point is put down your brushes, step away from the painting and go take a nap.